Okay, this lecture is entitled Underlying Technologies, and these are some of the underlying technologies, a lot of this at layer one, some at layer two, of the OSI model that we're supposed to mention in this course. Um, so we have talked about some of this already. So we may have a wired LAN. Um, we've already talked about that, about signaling and about bit representation on the media. Uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about the media other than to say uh, I think that, that it was copper and that we use ele electrical signals uh, when we're talking about uh, copper cable. So here's um, kind of a picture um, in 161. I'm not sure about 160. If you had an in-person class, you probably made cables. And the first part was to strip off this outer jacket, which shows uh, four twisted pairs. Now, this is unshielded twisted pair. It's just four pairs of twisted wire in a cable. We can also have a um, shielded twisted pair uh, where you have what looks like aluminum foil wrapped around either all four conductors or um, possibly each pair of conductors, possibly with another, um, kind of looks like aluminum foil shield on the outer of the cable, uh, which attempts to try to cut down on interference uh, that the cable might receive. We have cable categories. Uh, CAT3 it was really, really old, but that was the first one that was used for Ethernet. I think it was originally uh, designed for telephone. So we have categories, and within these categories, there's specifications about how many twists they have to be, what frequency can they operate at, that type of thing. So there's been a progression from CAT3 to CAT4 to CAT5, 5E, 6, etc. that's shown here. Uh, these days, I would say most of the cable is probably CAT5E or CAT6, but you may see some of these uh, newer standards. And as a, we go through the number, again, it becomes more stringent on the tests they have to be passed to declare that they're of that particular category. Uh, with twisted pair Ethernet, the maximum length is 100 meters. So you should not have runs from like your switch to a computer that's more than 100 meters, 300 feet. Uh, the next type of cable that we have is fiber optic cable. Uh, there is a picture to the right that shows the different parts of the cable. A lot of this is really for strengthening and not breaking that middle core, which is going to be plastic or glass. And if you bend it too much, it's going to fracture or break and cause the cable not to work correctly. Uh, when we talk about fiber, there's multi-mode and single mode. Um, I tell my in-person classes that everything's backwards in, in fiber optic cable. You know, if I just told you you knew nothing about fiber optic and said, hey, for $600 you can buy some single mode fiber or you can buy some multi-mode fiber, uh, which would you get? And most people would say multi-mode because multi sounds like many. Maybe it's faster. Uh, in reality, single mode fiber has a smaller core and uses a laser to send the beam down. So it's pretty much direct light down the center of the core. In the case of multi-mode, it could be plastic and it could be a light emitting diode instead of a laser and the signal is going to be able to bounce around within the cladding, kind of up, bump up, down uh, as it travels, uh, which is not going to give you as good of um, quality signal. Uh, one of the big things in the Cisco curriculum that they kind of harp on is the fact that uh, fiber is immune to electromagnetic interference. Uh, now, as far as the length, uh, that's one advantage, the immunity. 
Another length is the distance. Um, for multi-mode fiber, you can run this, um, you know, for two kilometers, which is a little less than two miles, or um, 40 uh, kilometers uh, for single mode. So that's a pretty long distance. So you can run fiber a really long distance. Um, the other thing we hadn't talked about, um, you know, I mentioned this in 161, but I don't know that we've talked about it here in 219, is the standards for wired LANs is in IEEE 802.3. So IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer. They're a standards organization that creates lots of standards. One of their standards is 802, which is computer networking. And dot three is Ethernet. Uh, you know, eight, IEEE 802.11 is wireless. But everything in 802 deals with uh, networking. In one of my class years ago, I said, I'm sure there's an IEEE 803, but I have no, no idea what it is. But it's not computer networking. And one of my students Googled it and said, IEEE 803 is a standard for naming devices in a power plant. So it's electrical in nature, but you know, something totally different than the networking in IEEE 802. Um, we can have wireless LANs. Uh, we've already talked about how the signaling and bit representation works on a wireless LAN in a previous video. The maximum range is approximately 300 feet without any obstructions. If you're indoors with walls, uh, they typically say it's 150 feet. Uh, there's a relatively new standard called WiMAX. Uh, its range is 3 to 6 kilometers. And a lot of times WiMAX is used if you're trying to cover a whole city. We can have point-to-point -point WANs. Uh, this is where the communication happens between two routers that are directly connected to each other. Examples of this would be T1 lines, OC12 optic lines, uh, DSL, cable modems, uh, PPP, etc. We can have switch LANs, uh, which are used to connect multiple end nodes through a common WAN network. Uh, basically, this is a wide area network, but it's wired up similarly to how a local area network, a LAN, would be wired up. Examples of this are ISDN, which is Integrated Services Digital Network. It's getting network services and voice services simultaneously through your phone company. Uh, when people first started working from home, ISDN was the, the way you you did that most often. Uh, sorry, there was ATM there. Uh, ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, is pretty much obsolete these days, but that was an example of a switched LAN. Uh, as far as connecting devices uh, to a network, we must have some type of media. Uh, the device we're connecting must have a network interface card that supports, that plugs into your computer and supports the uh, media that you chose. And then, very, very important, I really harp on this. Again, harping on this means you'll see it on homework, you'll see it on exams. Uh, this is so important that in my 167 class, I probably ask it on four different homeworks. And even on the fourth homework, there were still one or two students that were not getting this correct. So for a device to communicate successfully on the network, three things have to be configured correctly. The first thing is that device needs to have an IP address. It needs to have a subnet mask and it needs to have a default gateway or default router. Some people will call it the, the router of last resort, but default gateway, default router are the most common, 
And again, the default gateway is if you don't have a device on your network you're communicating with, that you're communicating that's in another network, uh, that packet will go to the default gateway and then continue over the internet uh, from there. So that finishes up the lecture on underlying technologies.